Great, welcome everybody. Um, the title of the session today is Digital Disruption, the Internet of Things and the Rise of Marketplaces. Um, I'm happy to introduce our speakers to you today. Um, so starting on the left, uh, I, far over there, I have Brian Schwears, the general manager of CPQ at Aptis. Right here in the middle, um, Ben Allen, general manager of Quote to Cash at Aptis. And last but certainly not least, um, on my left right here, uh, I have Chris Primesberger. He's the editor of features and analysis uh, at the media publication eWeek. Um, so with that, I'm happy to turn it over. All right, thanks a lot. Can you all hear me? Theoretically, anyway, I've never spoken to a silent crowd like this before. I think this is great. Welcome to our session. We're just starting off. I'm Chris Primesberger. I'm co-editor of eWeek, and I noticed that in the program they got me as founder and editor-in-chief. Thanks for the promotion. I appreciate that. I'm going to go in and, and talk to our uh, CFO as soon as we're finished here and get a raise. Thanks for coming. Uh, eWeek has been around for 33 years. We were PC Week for a long time. Uh, changed over to eWeek in 2000 when we realized we painted ourselves into a corner with that brand because uh, we don't just cover PCs, but we cover B2B um, IT and have for a long, long time. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, we, uh, a little more, a few more metrics. We publish about 20 stories every business day, so we're pretty high volume. I usually write one or two a day as much as I can. Um, and I cover, I used to be the storage guy, but now I cover lots of different things. And I love, I love covering cloud, BPM, um, anything to do with the new gen IT, which is what we are, we're all here for. Um, David mentioned our, our headline today is uh, digital disruption, the internet of things, and the rise of marketplaces. We could easily do a whole, not only an hour, we could probably do a whole conference on each one of those. But we're gonna try to edit everything down as best we can. We're gonna have a conversation as though I'm interviewing them for eWeek, and you guys can all eavesdrop. How's that? Um, I'm gonna start off by saying I'm, I'm always skeptical of the term digital disruption, okay? It's a buzzword. But you know what? It explains what's going on right now. Everything's being disrupted. Um, we see it as the hottest buzz phrase around. But it's true because digital is being disrupted not only on a, on a regular basis, but on a daily and weekly basis. And this is all largely due to what we see as a recent convergence of a set of important factors that have all prodded us to work faster and more efficiently. And these factors are commodity computing, unlimited storage, big, fast network pipes, faster than we've ever had before, faster and leaner code being iterated constantly, the explosion of mobile devices creating all this content, and cloud services like Aptis and others, Salesforce and others, that are helping move businesses at relatively lightning speed as opposed to old school business process management tools and practices. Let me paint a picture of how we see this disruption. It's like the co confrontation between a pitcher and a batter in baseball. We're right across from AT&T Park, so this is an appropriate, appropriate analogy. Baseball has got great analogies anyway. Um, it's like the confrontation between a pitcher and, a, and batter in baseball. The batter is trying to disrupt the fact that the pitcher wants to strike him out and keep him off the bases. After swinging and missing on the first pitch, the batter has been partially disrupted. Now it's up to him to make an adjustment to his approach so that he's not disrupted into strike two. The pitcher may also adjust his approach for pitch two. Sometimes it's more of a chess game than a baseball game. But the, the net net of this is, whichever person, the pitcher or batter, is successful in that one little battle though, is the one who's disrupted the other and wins the point or wins the at-bat. And it's not that different in, in business. A business has its idea to sell something. It is disrupted. It needs to rethink its approach to disrupt the disruptor. Maybe, Brian, you're going to talk about that, hopefully, because I want to hear about your theory on this. Uh, for example, when a company like TiVo, which is an Aptis customer, comes on like gangbusters in the television business, it made old school VCRs obsolete. obsolete. But then as on-demand on cable networks came into the picture, TiVo was disrupted. But then it made its own adjustments. And as the market changed, TiVo changed. And TiVo is doing quite well right now. Brian, you want to pick that up a little bit? We talked a yeah, little bit about that. I think it's interesting that we see, you know, from the beginning of time, there's this give and take in disruption. It hadn't always been digital disruption, but Henry Ford disrupted the buggy whip manufacturing company. He didn't need a computer to do it, but there was a disruption. 
you just mentioned that you changed your name from PC Week to eWeek. We were That's a disruption, right? Yep. Something's changed in the marketplace that caused you to have to rebrand and refocus Absolutely. in order to stay relevant. And that's what we see with the digital capabilities today is that throughout all of the B2B industries, companies are being disrupted by their competitors, by the needs of their customers, and they're looking for new ways to use the digital technology to gain that competitive advantage in what many times is otherwise a commoditized market. Absolutely. So we've got a couple questions I want to ask you, pose to you. Whichever one of you wants to take the question, take the lead on it, and we can, we can all discuss it. Um, given that, um, you know, I, I'm impressed, first of all, as I look at the marketing charts, I see Aptis up there with Oracle and IBM holding its own in several markets. I think, given that you operate with companies in the Fortune 500, do you see innovation happening in what might be commonly uh, seen as the stodgier companies? Are they leading the charge or are they trailing? the older, more established conventional companies? Uh, I'll take the lead on that one. I think we see um, it, a couple different camps, and I think there are um, folks who were, whose companies were born in the digital era, and for them, it is easier to innovate because they don't have any of the legacy baggage, <clears throat> but also they've grown up in an app world, in a world where they start with the customer experience and work back. What we're seeing with some of the more established brands is uh, that they can sometimes struggle to get over that hump. And, and uh, if you're listening to Andy Hoare speak yesterday, you know, he talks about how some of these companies are saying that their customers aren't ready to deal with them in certain more modern ways. And that's really a legacy mindset that can hold them back from disruption. I think we're seeing a second wave of disruption, though, that is being led by the bigger Fortune 500 companies. Um, one, because they have the resources to do it on a grand scale. But second, because if they don't do something and do something pretty immediately, they'll be cannibalized uh, by these other competitors that are coming up. So um, as you can see from the, the charts that we put up, not just who we compete with, but who our customers are, we are dealing with enterprise customers, but we are dealing with enterprise customers who have a keen eye on innovation and disruption uh, themselves. And um, what we're starting to see in some of these larger companies is pockets of innovation or just teams that are just carved out specifically to find innovation. And while that is, is possibly sufficient for the time being, they're competing against companies, these newer digital era companies, whose whole mindset is just that innovation and disruption. And so I don't think it's going to be sufficient for them to have just a team that's making strategic recommendations on innovation, but to actually change the mindset about how they're uh, approaching the market generally. Yeah. And uh, it's also harder for big companies to make, as, as it would be for, to steer a large ship, right. to try to make an adjustment quickly. You just can't do it if you're a huge, huge organization with layers and layers of management. Yeah, but the problem is that the customer doesn't care. Uh, right. They don't care what size That's your organization right. is. They care what your product or service is and, and how you're servicing them. And more importantly nowadays, are they caring about your service as compared to your product? Products generally are being commoditized holistically. I mean, we've seen that with uh, all sorts of, of technology, yeah. hardware, and it's yeah. much more about the, the service that's provided, whether it's a subscription service or just customer service. Um, it is uh, mandatory that you meet the customer expectation, or they have almost no barrier to, to going to a competitor who does. Yeah. And I think that subscription model is important, right? Because what we see, obviously, we're in the SaaS business, so subscription software as a so service is an obvious play. But what we see now is everything as a service. We've got companies that are sell Lenovo, right? Selling laptops as a service. But you think about where does the digital disruption play into that? How can I sell you a usage-based laptop if I can't track your usage? How can I sell you a usage-based x-ray machine if I can't track the images you produced, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the digital technology comes in and enables the subscription model to, to do something much more, you know, than what I could have done if I sold it as a perpetual license. And even in, the, in some of the companies that are selling the most physical of physical goods, think about GE with jet engines, yep. they're selling those as a service, right? And, and that <laughs> requires you to have some uh, digital connection to what the usage of that, of that yep. engine is um, and when it may need to be replaced. And that's when we start to talk about the other topic here is Internet of Things, is when we talk about that jet engine, it itself needs to be able to communicate back to 
you know, whatever system is fulfilling its yeah. servicing, its spare parts and things like that, um, you know, it's, it, the, the standards by which customers expect to be served are demanding the sort of Internet of Things. It's not that the Internet of Things is a, is a cool idea that we can capitalize on. It, it is a necessary yeah. component of being able to deliver the service uh, at the level the customer expects. I love hearing people say IoT is just a, a fad right, or something. It's like, what are you thinking? This is the first inning, this is another the baseball analogy, the first inning of all this, folks. We're just starting to figure out where it's all going to go. And I think one of the reasons that you hear people say that is because they, they themselves are not necessarily ready to address it or have a full understanding of how to address it, and they'll be forced to. Absolutely. I just talked to, along the same lines, you mentioned GE and jet engines. I just sat with a guy a little while ago from NetJets. Is he here? Did he come to the thing? He said he was coming. NetJets is a service. You can buy a 16th of an aircraft. Right. And it's like a timeshare. You think of a timeshare in Hawaii or Lake Tahoe. Well, you can do that with a luxury jet. And you can use it for X amount of hours per year. As many people as you want, go wherever you want. You pay for that ahead of time, it's a service. It's a luxury jet service. I just think that's really fabulous. And um, I think just went dead here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to wing it. I'm, gonna, I'm being disrupted by my own laptop. <laughs> There you go. Oh, there it so, goes. Somebody's got to come up with a better battery for yeah, it. No, this is this is a good one. This one just came out and it's got 12-hour battery supposedly. Yeah. I'm testing it to see if it's true. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go to another one here. Let's go to Aptus itself. Aptus and e-commerce and some other major areas are highly competitive, and possibly more mature markets in the mix for Aptus. Is this a pivot or a natural evolution? So I'll I'll start with that and. For those of you who haven't seen Tom Browning in the audience, he's our uh, GM of e-commerce. Um, and so if you have any e-commerce related questions after this, feel free to attack him. Um, but e-commerce, if you look at the Aptus portfolio of products, and you know we always show you the slide that has 20 different products on it. Um, I will say, first of all, not one of those decisions to enter a product area has been because we thought there was a massive market opportunity. It was because we thought it was a natural extension of what we were doing. And in fact, since the birth of CPQ, the idea behind CPQ was to make configuration of complex products easier and more manageable by a salesperson. And it wasn't a far cry or, or a big leap in logic to say, if you can do that for a salesperson, why not offer the same experience to a customer or to a partner who has that exact same uh, need to uh, navigate through that configuration. So I would say we probably didn't make the physical leap as rapidly as, as we may have like to do it in retrospect, but what we saw was a natural evolution from people who were using CPQ to people who wanted to offer that same service as just self-service quoting. But then if you take the lens of customer experience, almost none of your customers, I can't imagine probably you have any customers, who want to log into your website, create an opportunity for themselves, populate a cart with items, produce a quote, send themselves the quote, accept the quote, get it back to you and have that be the way that they submit an order, right? And we've all been trained, I mean, as much as we, and again, I'll echo Andy Hoare here, as much as we've all been trained to operate in a B2B world with the way that B2B companies sell, we're all also B2C consumers, and we have an expectation on how we want to be served as consumers. Uh, and the interesting stat for me out of Andy Hoare's research is that while 95 plus percent of B2B customers want to buy in B2B the same way that they buy in B2C, only 25% of B2B customer, uh, companies actually offer that experience to their customers. And the reason isn't because they don't think their customers want it. Sometimes that is a reason. I think that's you know, the naive reason, but most people actually would like to do that. It's just it's tougher. It's tougher in B2B to give someone what the product that they have is, because they may be thinking about it in terms of a product code or a part number or something like that. They don't want to navigate through a catalog of 10,000 parts. Um, they may have a contracted price that is not the price that you're going to serve up to them on a bland website, right? They're not going to transact at a price that's 30% higher than their, than their contracted price simply because that's what's served to them on the website. So you need to take that complexity that you solved for already in CPQ and in contract management, but be able to offer the simple customer experience that someone's expecting when they go to a website that looks a heck of a lot like uh, Amazon or, or any of those major uh, e-tailers that we're used to dealing with. It's got to be that simple but it's got to be able to handle the back-end complexity as well. Yeah, and I think you make a good point then, that you know the buyers are people and they're informed by the, their experience 
in real world in the consumer market. So Amazon.com and Google and now Amazon Echo, right? So what are you doing in your home life and how is that informing your decisions about how to change your business start is I think how it starts to bleed over into B2B space. And, and it is a buyer's market, especially if you're selling commodity products. What are you trying to do? We, right? It make it easier for the customer to interact with you. An analyst told me recently that um, the average business in America wants to move 50% of their sales into self-service mode. And to your point, if I'm selling complex configured products, it's not Amazon. So, and this is a, obviously a key place where Aptus plays in having the ability to surface CPQ, CLM, and some of our other core capabilities into that online marketplace can allow them to make that leap into a true B2B platform. Yeah, the, umbrella, the umbrella to all this is a customer experience, whether you're buying a movie ticket or 10,000 servers for your data center. That's right. No doubt, and I, I think this gets on a point that we've actually discussed at length, which is, one of the legacy mindsets in B2B that has to go is that the B2B company or the seller is in charge of that buying process right, right. or in charge of that selling right. process. That's right. Just as in B2C where we do all the research and then transact, um, B2B buyers are doing so much more research and engaging you so much further down the funnel that if you presume that you're going to be able to control much of that, then, then you're lost. You need to understand where they are researching you, when they contact you, how much information they already have about you and the competitive offerings, right. uh, and how much of that experience you can control. And at the end of the day, it may only be the buying experience that you can control because they may have made up their mind about the products or capabilities or anything that they want. And at that point, it becomes who's easiest to do business with. And so, if you haven't solved for being easy to do business with, you may have lost the entirety of the battle right there. Right. So Chris, if you bring it back to the core question, is this an evolution of quote to cash? We think of quote to cash in terms of opportunity quote, whatever. In e-commerce world, let's call it click to cash. Is it a different process? Does it have all the same foundations? Yeah. It, right? So, so what about service to cash? Mm -hmm. right? Is it possible that there's customers of yours that call into a call center with a break fix issue or a technical issue and that spawns a quote for a spare part or for a roll yeah. a truck? What, how much is it going to cost you to come fix this? So quote to cash is sort of the first use case, the most common use case, but click to cash certainly is what, a sister or brother use case or yeah. service to cash, right? So we can think through how do these same components serve multiple needs within your right. organization. And, and this is all disruptive to what's out there now. We're evolving. That's right. The disruption's happening, you gotta jump on it. Um, we haven't talked about marketplaces yet, and that's part of this thing. We've talked about the IoT, we've talked about um, the uh, disruption. So if uh, e-commerce isn't exactly new, but B2B e-commerce is still in its early stages, what is the promise of online marketplaces, and what should companies consider as they embark on these, on these efforts for their own marketplaces in their own, in their own verticals? I'll, I'll take that, and it's actually a great question for, for Todd if you want the double and triple click on this. Um, <laughs> but the, the real answer double is... Double and triple click to, to cash? <laughs> to, uh, click to cash. Um, <laughs> frankly, the answer on, on what is the value of marketplaces is, is core to what is the valuation of your company. I mean, if you look at companies like Amazon who have been able to offer marketplaces that aggregate buyers and sellers um, and that's important, they're not just aggregating buyers, they're aggregating sellers as well to be able to offer things uh, in a marketplace, then you're in control of much more of the commerce spectrum. Now, there is a, a, a huge promise there, right? You're capturing the revenue, you're taking your, your share of the profits, all of that. Um, but the considerations are, are equally, if not more important. To, to reference the baseball analogy, first of all, this is not a scenario where, where if you build it, they will come. Uh, you, can't just, you can't just build the marketplace and expect that people are going to want right. to want to be there. You have to find where people want to buy and have that be an accommodation of what they want to buy, where they want to buy, and have it be the most sensible place for them to buy it. So, for instance, in an example that we had last year, if you're a tractor manufacturer, but your farmers are also buying, they're buying spare parts from you, but they may be buying feed and seed, they may be buying irrigation products, if they do truly want a one-stop shop and you are in control largely of that person's buying experience for one of those aspects, then you may be accommodating that, that buyer 
by providing the ability for them to transact all in one marketplace. It's fantastic, and that actually gives them a better customer experience. However, when you're thinking that through and where many of these marketplace projects fall short is in understanding the complexity between all of those different relationships. And I was talking to Todd earlier about the relationships that are embedded in a marketplace have to do with very tactical, complex things like who's going to pay the tax? You know, who's going to, who's going to pay for the, the traffic to be driven there? All that sort of stuff. The planning phase of a marketplace needs to go through the first iteration, which is, does it make sense for me to offer a marketplace in the first place? Then it needs to go through the second iteration, which is, of the possible participants in the market, who should be participating in this particular marketplace? And then the third is, okay, given that those are the participants, what are the commercial arrangements between all of us? Mm -hmm. And then the fourth, and it is a journey, is, okay, now if we're gonna build it, how are we gonna make that the place that people want to be? And it's much easier to have that be the place that they already want to be and you're offering more products and services rather than standing something up net new that is totally unfamiliar to them and is a new way to buy. Remember, the whole thing we're trying to do here is accommodate the buyer on how they want to buy and make it easier and, and better for them to buy in that place. And if you're not doing that, then the marketplace will certainly fall flat. So the disruption's coming in layers. Absolutely. Kind of. But it's, you're not spoon feeding people, but you're not throwing it all at them at one time. Absolutely. And I think if you look at the Amazon journey, it's exactly those phases, right? They started selling books, and you went there to buy books, and you stopped going to the bookstore. Now they sell diapers, right? <laughs> now they rent on-demand movies. And why? Because they've created this marketplace that people are going to return to. It became sticky. And once it became sticky, I could start to introduce other products. A lot of what you buy on Amazon isn't even sold by Amazon, right? It, it is truly a marketplace. And why do people sell their stuff at Amazon? Because people go to Amazon to buy stuff. There's right? one more interesting point there, and I apologize, I'm going to echo Andy Hoare again. He's like my e-commerce Jesus. Um, <laughs> but what his point about Amazon was is Amazon has evolved into more than a marketplace. In fact, Amazon is substantially a consumer search engine. And so the way that we interact with Amazon is not just to find the products or services we want, it's where we do the research. And if you provide the place where someone can start and finish that transaction, start the research, find the customer reviews, find competing products, and then consummate the transaction there, then that is a better experience. And that is where I do my research yeah. on products. I, I don't Google them or I'll end up in some you know, right, right. sphere of blogs that are gonna give me a bunch of different opinions. What I want is to see the products, see the offerings, see the competitive offerings, see the price, see what sort of discount I can get and be able to do that all in one experience. And, and take, it, take all that information to the brick and mortar store if you want to also. A lot of people doing that. Yep. You know? So Amazon's become a trusted advisor. There you go. Yeah. Right, and that is a good thing for you guys to think about as you build your marketplaces, is how does that B2B website not just be a place to transact purchases, but to actually be that trusted advisor. Your field sales reps, your SEs, whatever, have traditionally been that trusted advisor. You're selling complex products, you need a trusted advisor. So what do you need to do in that B2B website to, to become that virtual trusted advisor. Yeah, right? we've got about two, two minutes left, guys. I mean, I can't believe how fast this has gone, but do we want to maybe summarize here some of the key points we talked about? Uh, Did you take notes? <laughs> I've got them right here on this. I didn't take any notes. I should have if I'm interviewing you for eWeek. I don't know. Sure, I think we can summarize, but I think one, one other maybe that ties this up is if you see what Amazon is doing now, which is actually in some locations introducing bricks and mortar storefronts, yeah. you can see what their guiding principle is, which is not to drive everyone to necessarily the lowest cost area to do the business, but where the customer actually wants to buy. Yeah. And so in, in any of these accommodations, whether you're talking about digital disruption, whether you're talking about marketplaces, whether you're talking about Internet of Things, it is in reducing the friction overall for the customer to transact. And in fact, it shouldn't necessarily be that the customer is feeling like they're consummating a transaction. It should be like they are engaging in their relationship with you yeah. in the way that makes the most sense to them, that is the most frictionless to them, that can become part of their life and remove friction from whatever process it is that they're actually trying to do on a day-to-day -day Yeah, you're basis. working with a trusted friend, an advisor, right. in, in accomplishing something, a purchase for something that you need. So I will tell you, my last thought is in our CPQ session over in the sales exec track yesterday, 
um, Forrester presented about, uh, John Bruno from Forrester presented where he saw CPQ going moving forward in, in the whole B2B sales. One of the things he talked about is the fact that we've traditionally seen a front office and a back office and that there's potentially the opening of a third office. And what he called it, and he wasn't saying this is the right name, but what he called it was the front line. And the idea that there is this front line application that is right there at the face of your buyer, right? Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting way to think about what we're saying here is that how do you get closer to your customer, right? Um, and if the buyers are engaging you later in a sales cycle than they traditionally have, and they're doing their research on your website, then that really is the yeah. front line of the decision. Absolutely. And the place where all that information needs to be served up. Ben, Brian, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very this. much. This has been great. If we were a radio show, we would be right on time. And <laughs> close. Fantastic. Thank, well, thank you. you guys.